I went and talked to the New Jurors about this, but uh, it's Paul Harvey time and time for the rest of the story. And like Paul Harvey, before I get into the rest of the story, I'm going to take a little bit of a break from the rest of the story and start out by thanking you. Um, I don't know if this is completely sunk in, but a week ago Monday we started with 140 people. Yesterday, to fill out the balance of the jury into this morning, we dealt with 50 more people, almost 200 people, get 15 of you. And I want to thank you for being here, going through that process, assuring us that you will be fair and impartial, that you will look at both sides of the story and keep an open mind. As you listened to the state's opening remarks, I hope it was clear to you that the items, the information about what's, what happened, who supposedly did it, it's all tied into Haley Bustos. Haley Bustos said this, Haley Bustos said this, Haley said this, Haley did this. It's based on Haley Bustos. And so let's focus on Haley Bustos. How did this matter in terms of what happened to Adam Hilaire even come on the police radar? It was because of Haley Bustos. It was Haley Bustos, along with Evelyn Belmont, who set up a Plenty of Fish account in order to contact males, to contact males that they could finesse out of money, that they could get money from. Haley Bustos and Evelyn Belmont. Mr. Warner had nothing to do with that. It was Haley Bustos and Evelyn Belmont. When the potential perpetrators of the offense, perpetrator of perpetrators, came on the police radar, again, what was the source of that? Haley Bustos. Mr. Warner had loaned Haley Bustos his car. She goes to Juanita. It was Haley Bustos who was spotted by the police in Juanita. And she was the person that they wanted to talk to. And when the police approached her, it was Haley Bustos that fled the police, actually managed to get away from the Winter Haven Police Department detectives, was able to escape in that car fleeing and managed to get away despite radios, other potential ways law enforcement can catch somebody. She fled and got away. Again, it was Haley Bustos. The first time that Mr. Warner even came on the radar and the scene was the police, because of the knowledge of this date, the police, because of their knowledge of Haley Bustos fleeing, their knowledge of where Miss Bustos may have fled, they go to that area, they're looking for a particular car, they're looking for Miss Bustos. Mr. Warner is leaving in the car. It's his car. He's driving away from that apartment. When the police pull over the car, guess what Mr. Warner does? He stops. He stops with the police. He doesn't flee like Haley Bustos. He stops. And it's through Mr. Warren, through this stop, that they learn Haley Bustos is there at that apartment. And she's taken into custody. The police speak with Miss Bustos. Miss Bustos told them a story, a 
about how she had nothing to do with what they were investigating. Story where she told him about the date with Adam Hilaire. Uh, tells them de details and nuances of the date. But it even gets more elaborate than that as she spins her story to the police. She tells them how after the date she woke up the next morning that she texted him that she had kind of wanted to wait a little while because she didn't want to appear to be too eager and she spun this story out where she actually told the police that later on the person who was dead texted her. She spun this story full of details designed to mislead the police and think that other than a date with Adam Hilaire she had nothing to do with this. It's kind of storyteller. The evidence will show that she is. When Haley Bustos tells a story of involvement in a crime, guess what she does? She minimizes her role. She minimizes the role of her good friend Josh Ellington and points the finger at somebody else. By her own admission and her own words, when Miss Bustos told the police that story, she was telling them a story that she felt that she would not even be charged. After telling the story of not knowing anything about it, that she then tells another story, were based on what she told the police. She actually thought she would not be charged with anything or at worst get into a little bit of trouble. That is what's going on with Haley Bustos. Miss Bustos thought that the story she told, that she wouldn't even go to jail. That was story number two. A story designed to get her out of trouble and keep her from going to jail. Well, what Miss Bustos, what Haley Bustos did tell the police resulted in her being charged with first degree murder. It resulted in her being charged with robbery with a firearm. It resulted in her being charged with conspiracy to commit robbery. And she was charged with burglary with a firearm. Despite thinking that she wouldn't even go to jail because of the story she told, Ms. Bustos finds herself in jail facing a mandatory life sentence for murder, a life sentence for robbery, a sentence of 15 years for the conspiracy, and a sentence of 30 years for a burglary. What does Haley Bustos do? She enters into an agreement with the state where she agrees to testify for the state against Mr. Warner and in exchange for her testimony. Judge, I'm going to object. Can you approach? Please approach. All right, we are going to take a commercial break right now. We will get you right back into the courtroom. We promise you won't miss a thing in the dating app murder trial in Florida. This is Court TV, your front row seat to justice. Welcome back to Court TV Live, your front row seat to justice. I'm Julie Grant. We are watching the dating app murder trial in Florida. Opening statements happening now. The defense is up. Attorney Robert Norgard delivering the open for the defense. There was a little break in the action when we went to commercial break. Let's get you right back into the courtroom where we left off. 
Oh, and uh, forgive me. I'm so sorry about that. I am being told we want to bring in our guest uh, while we're waiting for that break in the action to be over in the courtroom. I want to bring in criminal defense attorney Josh Schiffer, who is watching the opening statements being delivered in this case. Josh, a short time ago, I got your take on the state's open. How about the defense? What do you think so far? You know, one of the advantages of being the defendant, uh, there's not very many of them, but one of them is you get to see the state go first. And in this case, the state proceeded with this very methodical presentation, and the defense has matched that. They're not going out and trying to sell a defense like a used car. This is very thoughtful. It's turned out. It's been contemplated. And the defense attorney in these kind of high-gravity cases where the death penalty is on the line, they've redefined what winning is. Winning isn't walking your client out the front door with an acquittal. Winning is preventing a needle in an arm. So these cases aren't tried the way that a lot of people think they should be, where you're going for the home run, everybody gets acquitted and walks out. No, you're trying to save someone's life. You're trying to stop the ultimate punishment from being carried forth by a state that likely has pretty good reasons to ask for what it wants. Absolutely, Josh. I, I couldn't agree more. The long game is what this defense team most certainly has in mind. We know that this is a very seasoned defense team, especially Bob Norgard, who's delivering the open. Uh, one of the other members of the legal panel today told us he knows him personally, um, known for being a really solid defense attorney in Bartow County. So certainly very capable of handling this very serious case. And we're seeing early on in the open, he's really villainizing Haley Bustos, uh, which we thought he might. Uh, your thoughts on that? Well, I think Haley is definitely at the absolute center of this criminal conspiracy, whether she's an active participant or a tool. Um, how the jury views her participation is huge in whether they're going to be able to make a decision at the end of this trial uh, to vote for an execution or something of that nature, or whether they're going to punish him with life in prison. Also, how the co-defendants and cross-defendants get brought into the trial, we don't know exactly how they're going to come in. We have some suspicions, but the state has kept its cards close to its vest, and we don't know exactly what that testimony is going to look like. So the defense has to be available and ready to think on the fly in how to respond to whatever testimony comes out. These individuals, the Cross and co-defendants, they're testifying in exchange for good treatment. We know that. But how that good treatment is brought forward, how it fits into the defense of this individual who is facing the death penalty, that's what everybody is concentrating on right now. Absolutely. And we know both sides want Haley Bustos to be seen in a very different light. We have a clip from the state's open talking about how Haley Bustos got brought into the case. Let's watch. That Thursday, August 18th, 2016, the day before the murder, hours before the murder, Haley was hanging out at Evelyn Belmont's apartment. The frustrations that Evelyn had about needing money to pay her bills was a topic, and Evelyn suggested to Haley that there's a way we can get money. And Evelyn showed Haley how to create an account on Plenty of Fish and told her this is a way that I have finessed, in her words, money from men, whether it be through prostituting or talking them out of their money in the way that she did. Haley agreed to, to set up the account with that motivation in mind. And you're going to learn that shortly after setting up that account, and I think that the way the Plenty of Fish account works is you set up your account, and then it allows you to see people in your direct vicinity who are available to communicate with, which is how she ended up communicating with Adam Hilaire. Okay, so the prosecutor talking quite a bit about this woman named Evelyn Belmont, Josh, this woman that Haley Bustos was staying with at this time and who showed her how to make that Plenty of Fish account. What do you think the jury may be thinking with respect to her? 
Well, you know, it's another unknown vector since we haven't seen any testimony about her. This is all just what the state expects to be able to prove. We'll have to see how these people actually testify live and whether their stories match up because jurors, jurors are naturally cynical uh, and you want to exploit that as a defense attorney from what the state is putting forward because it's the state. You don't always trust what the state is doing. Um, in the opening, you want to make promises that you can fulfill if you're carrying the burden of proof as the state does in a criminal case. So they're going to put forward a series of assumptions, assertions, and promises about facts that they need to come through with. The defense is going to show how those promises, assertions, facts, and statements aren't real, how they shouldn't be relied on, or how the people making those statements, they're so biased they can't be trusted. Absolutely. Never make a promise you can't deliver on. Josh Schiffer, thank you so much for lending us your legal expertise. I am told that when they went to that sideboard, they then went on a 15-minute break. That is now over. So let's go back into the courtroom live. Well, the defense knows their limitation. The state knows its limitation and how far they can go with uh, the understanding as to impeaching uh, Ms. Bustos or any statements she gave and what, if any, expectations she may have. So with that in mind, uh, bring in the jury, please. Judge, Judge, I just want to make sure that we're clear that Mr. Norbert is not going to use the language that there was some deal entered into in exchange for her testimony. Because that's exactly what he said, and that's not what happened. That's not true at all. Okay. And yeah. I'd also be asking for a curative instruction to the, to the jury. You're asking the court to instruct the jury to do exactly what? To let them know that... To remember what the attorney said is not evidence. Because now it's out there, and I don't want the jury to think that in any way, shape, or form that what Mr. Norgard said is true. Because it's not true. Defense, as to the state's request. <laughs> it is true. The agreement. As to, let's do this one at a time, yeah, Mr. Norgard. State is requesting that I tell or remind the jury that opening statements is not evidence. Any objection? Yes, sir. No objection? I, I do object. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. okay. Any objection? My answer is yes. Okay, just uh, make sure we're on the same page. All right, um, and what is it the defense's intent, if any, uh, as far as language regarding any deals with Ms. Bustos? Yeah, I, I never called it a plea deal. Um, I was going to get into the fact that uh, by entering into this proffer agreement, she was agreeing to provide substantial assistance that could result in her uh, potentially entering into a plea where the state would evaluate her cooperation. I'll use the language straight out of the proffer agreement. Okay. All right, that'd be the court's expectation as to the curative uh, instruction uh, requested by the state. Your request is denied. I've already told them that uh, opening statements and closing remarks are, are not evidence, and they'll be further instructed on that issue. All right, bring in the jury, sir. So that little back and forth was about something defense counsel said in his open. He made mention that Haley Bustos was getting a deal in exchange for her testimony. You saw the prosecutor adamantly refuting that, saying that is not true. She's not getting a deal. She may down the line, but as of right now, no. And the prosecutor was asking for a curative instruction from the court. That means a way of curing, if you will, what was just put out there. We know we can't unring the bell, can't put toothpaste back in the tube. The jury can't unhear what they just heard about Haley Bustos getting a deal. So the court ultimately denied that, saying that he has already told this jury that opening statements are not evidence, meaning the opening statements are a guide, a framework, but not evidence to be used in deciding the case. So I can imagine we will see more objections from the prosecution should defense counsel try to do that again and make mention of Haley Bustos getting a deal, them saying, no, that's not true. No deal has been made. And they're very smart not to make a deal at this point because that would be something the defense can explore on cross-examination. It would go to her believability. Let's go back in together live. The rest of what's in that 911 call is, uh, is, is in our position excludable under 9403. Probative value of all the emotion that you hear and things of that nature is uh, uh, substantially outweighed by the danger of unfair prejudice and we're objecting to the call coming in. 
state. And judge, the, the call demonstrates how Mr. Hilaire's body was found by his roommate. Um, it shows the timeline of events, and the state would be asking that it be uh, played. Is there a transcript of the call no, state? Sir. Okay, well, I have to listen to it for me to be able to assess uh, if the objection is 90.403. Um, but, of course, the, the truly main question, I've been saying this for years, I don't know why we wait to this time to raise that um, that objection. Now, <laughs> um, all right, folks, it is our job to the extent that we can to minimize distractions, to, mi to minimize delays to our citizens that we that put up with us for a week and two days due selection. So, um, th things do come up last minute, and we have to deal with them. But this is definitely an issue that should not have been addressed right now. Um, and I guess that be would that be through the testimony of the first witness, State? Not the first witness, Judge, the second witness. Okay. What we'll do then, we'll take a break between the first and the second witness so I can hear it. And approximately how long is the recording, State? Six minutes. Okay, six minutes. That's I'll, I'll just have to hear it. Um, and if there's any further objection, I'll deal with that. Okay. Thank you, man. All right. So what that back and forth was over is a 911 call that the state wants to play. And the court, you just heard him say he's going to be reviewing that. We understand the caller on that 911 call is the victim's roommate, Adam Hillary's roommate, John Hun. Um, and so that's going to be reviewed, of course, outside of the jury's presence to see if that is, in fact, admissible evidence. We know it wasn't played in the open, perhaps because there's been an objection raised prior to trial, maybe an emotion in limine to keep that out. Not sure, but that's what's going to happen over the next couple minutes. Comes. Distractions. And for friends, family, and, and citizens who are uh, observing the trial, keep in mind, folks, that uh, uh, the schedule that we work with we start about 8.45 on a given, on a given morning. We take a mid-morning break, we take a lunch break, and we take a mid-afternoon break. So try to the extent that we can to minimize traffic in and out of a courtroom. You will not be restrict, restricted unless it amounts to a distraction. At this point, I don't think it rose to that level, but just keep that in mind um, because I, for one, have a tendency to look up every time I see somebody move. Um, and that may, uh, uh, I, I expect, could be distracting to our jurors um, who are trying to pay attention to uh, what is going on in the courtroom. So just keep that in mind. If you have to leave, you have to leave. Um, and if you're late, you're late. But just make sure that can be a distraction. Uh, and if it does, I will deal with it. Mr. Norgard, you may continue. Thank you. Now for the rest of the rest of the story. Where I had gotten to is I'd explained that Ms. Bustos in that first statement to the police was not successful in her efforts of minimizing her role, avoiding being charged, avoiding being arrested, and she found herself in jail facing first-degree murder, armed robbery, conspiracy to commit armed robbery, and burglary, and facing the penalties I talked about. Ms. Bustos? entered into what is called a proffer agreement with the state attorney's office. This will be gone into in more detail as the case develops, but I'm going to talk to you about certain portions of it. In the proffer agreement, it is indicated that Ms. Bustos is aware that in providing a proffer to the state attorney, that at the time of the proffer, there's no plea deal in place. It goes on to say, however, if the pending prosecution is ultimately resolved by Haley Bustos 
entering into an agreement to plead guilty to criminal charges. The state agrees to consider whether such full and complete cooperation qualifies as substantial assistance, the determination of the level of cooperation, and of whether such cooperation rises to the level of substantial assistance to the state shall be in the sole discretion of the state attorney. What does that mean for Ms. Bustos? In her own words, what it means is she is hoping that by testifying against Mr. Warren, that she will avoid a life sentence. Ms. Bustos has essentially said that she's doing everything she can to get a favorable plea deal, favorable plea deal from the state, and that's her motivation. She is hoping that her cooperation will get her the best deal she can possibly get. She knows that it's up to the state attorney's office and the state decides whether or not she gets that deal. She knows that in terms of, who, of her cooperation. And that by testifying, she's helping herself avoid a life sentence to get the least amount of years she can get and to come out of this as best she can, including hoping that she just gets some time. That's the motive of Ms. Bustos. The state's case that you've heard in opening statement comes from Haley Bustos, who from the word go in her involvement with the police was to get herself out of trouble, to minimize the amount of trouble she would get in, and to come out of this as best she can. Witness who the evidence will show is motivated by her own self-interest. What she can get out of this and her fear of what could happen to her. Thank you.